On behalf of the Center for Africana Studies, I'd like to welcome you to the 2015 Honorable A. Leon Higginbotham Jr. Memorial Lecture. This annual lecture, which honors the legacy of Judge Higginbotham, is co-sponsored by the Center for Africana Studies and Penn Law. We're delighted to have Professor Kendall Thomas with us to present this year's Higginbotham Lecture. Before we get started, it's my great pleasure, pleasure excuse me, to introduce Theodore Ruger, Dean, and Bernard G. Siegel, Professor of Law, who will present welcoming remarks from the law school. Dean Ruger is a scholar of constitutional law specializing in the study of judicial authority and an expert on health law and pharmaceutical regulation. Ruger practiced law at Ropes and Gray in Boston and Williams and Conley in Washington, D.C., and began his academic career at Washington University in St. Louis. He holds a JD from Harvard Law and was law clerk for Justice Stephen Breyer of the United States Supreme Court and Judge Michael Boudin of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. Dean Ruger joined Penn Law in 2004 and previously served as Deputy Dean of the Law School. Please join me in welcoming Dean Theodore Ruger. Thank you, Thank you Professor Charles. Um, it is my great pleasure to, to be here in my first year or first semester as Dean and, and uh, host and welcome you to uh, the Higginbotham Lecture, uh, an important event in the life of, of the, the broader university and of Penn Law. Um, we're very proud to host this in conjunction with the Center for Africana Studies um, and host uh, Professor Kendall Thomas of Columbia, who's a Nash Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Study of Law at uh, Columbia Law School. Um, Professor Thomas joins a very long and distinguished list of Higginbotham uh, lecturers. Um, in this lecture today, we honor the memory of uh, Judge Leon Higginbotham, Jr., uh, who was a figure distinguished across the country um, but also a very important figure in the life of Penn Law School. Uh, he was an active teacher of our students before being recruited away by Harvard Law School, something which uh, you know, we, we're on the watch for even today with our, our better teachers. Um, but he taught many students here for many years. Uh, he was on our Board of Overseers as well as um, Chairman of the Board of Overseers uh, during the 1980s. Uh, so he did in, in all of those roles, he did, he did much to shape uh, the Penn Law that we see today. Um, former Dean Colin Diver, one of my predecessors, when Judge Higginbotham um, left the law school, wrote uh, of him. Uh, he was an eminent jurist, lawyer, scholar, and statesman. Judge Higginbotham was truly a man of his time and a man of the world, yet he was also a loyal son of Pennsylvania, uh, his adopted university which he served with distinction for over 30 years as a trustee, overseer, teacher of sociology and law, mentor, advisor, and friends to hundreds of students, faculty, and staff. Uh, we also honor his legacy through this lecture for Judge Higginbotham's fight for, for social justice. Um, as many of you know, he was beyond a judge. He was an author uh, and wrote on these topics. And I'd like to read a couple of his sentiments that I think are as relevant today as when he wrote them about 20 years ago. Um, Judge Higginbotham was a student of the uh, legacy of slavery and oppression that we have in this country and a writing of that. He said, this legacy of slavery and oppression, I'm quoting now, which James Baldwin calls that darkness of degradation, every one of us must do something to correct. We must make justice and equality more real for those who are still partially in the chains of deprivation, powerless and poverty and we must pass on better opportunities for those who come after us. So those words ring as true today as they did when he wrote them. Um, and I would particularly highlight what he said, how every one of us must do something to correct, correct what he calls in a very evocative phrase, the darkness of degradation that we're still emerging from. Uh, I, would, I would also quote him in the title of his 1996 book, which is called Shades of Freedom. And he went on to write, I would emphasize this notion of, of shade and this notion that He's, 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 he's extending this uh, James Baldwin's darkness of degradation theme by saying that, and to use his words, there are rays of liberty and equality that are starting to pierce that, but we're still in the shade. Okay, this is not a binary on-off switch. We're still, uh, we're still emerging from this darkness of degradation. And, and so, his, so Higginbotham's title, I think, uh, Shades of Freedom, is what he, what he wrote in his book is that, yes, we've achieved some gains, we've achieved some rays of light, to, to use his metaphor, um, but, but we're still in the shade and we have, we have work to do. And those words are as true today as, as, as when he wrote them. So it's, 
it's, it's in his honor that we welcome Professor Nash uh, to speak to us today. And, and I thank Professor Nash, and I thank you all for coming. Thank you. Uh, it's with great pleasure now that I introduce Professor Kendall Thomas. Kendall Thomas is the Nash Professor of Law and co-founder of the direct and, and director of the Center for the Study of Law and Culture at Columbia University, where he joined the faculty in 1984. Thomas's teaching and research interests include U.S. and comparative constitutional law, human rights, legal philosophy, feminist legal theory, critical race theory, and law and sexuality. Thomas has been a visiting professor at Stanford Law School and visiting professor in American Studies and Afro-American Studies at Princeton University. He's taught or lectured in France, the Netherlands, England, the Czech Republic, Germany, Haiti, and South Africa. His writings have appeared in several academic journals and volumes of collected essays, and he is a co-editor of Critical Race Theory, the key writings that founded the movement, and as well as what's left of theory. Thomas was an inaugural recipient of the Berlin Prize Fellowship of the Acad American Academy in Berlin, Germany, and a member of the Special Committee of the American Center in Paris, France. He is also past chair of the Jurisprudence and Law and Humanities sections of the, Amer of the Association of American Law Schools. Professor Thomas is a founding member of the Majority Action Caucus of the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, Sex Panic, and the AIDS Prevention Action League. He is also a former member and vice chair of the board of directors of, Ga of Gay Men's Health Crisis. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kendall Thomas. Good afternoon. Thank you, Professor Charles and uh, Dean Ruger. And uh, thanks as well to Carol Garrison and the administrative team and Africana Studies who have uh, made it possible for me to be here this afternoon, it's still afternoon, uh, to talk to you about um, <clears throat> racial democracy and racial neoliberalism after the Obama presidency. I count it, uh, I can't even begin to tell you how honored I am to be standing here delivering the A. Leon Higginbotham Memorial Lecture. Judge Higginbotham was uh, a towering figure in the imagination of law students and young law professors of my generation. Uh, and uh, I would say of him what I say very often of my father in the law, the late Derek Bell. We are because he was and the legacy, the intellectual legacy that he leaves uh, as a judge, as a jurist, as a scholar and teacher, as an organic intellectual, uh, the son of a maid, uh, is one that I hold close to my heart. So it is especially meaningful to me to have the opportunity to give this lecture at a law school with which he was uh, so closely associated for such a long time. By way of beginning, let me take a pass at a few overlapping formulations of the question that I want to explore with you this afternoon, which also introduce the terms of the thought train that will carry my argument. How has the rhetorical presidency of Barack Obama reshaped the constitutional semantics of U.S. racial politics in the current uh, and arguably post-civil rights, post-black, or post-racial moment. In what ways and with what effects has President Obama's engagement with ideas and images of racial constitutionalism built on or broken with the expressed constitutional commitments of his predecessors? Do the changes in the rhetorical politics of race that have taken place under the Obama presidency represent a transformative constitutional moment in America? Should we interpret these recent shifts in the national political grammar uh, <clears throat> constitutionally as uh, a moment of fundamental change, an extra textual revision, or an informal amendment even of the symbolic constitution of race 
in the United States. What impact has Mr. Obama's reconstruction of racial word politics in the US had on the modes and mobilizations of our constitutional common sense about race? How have the refigurations of racial meaning set in motion by the Obama White House interpolated new constitutional subjects and subjectivities? What constitutive force will Barack Obama's rhetorical presidency exert on the future thrust and direction of US racial justice politics? To better understand the context and situation that make these questions pertinent to the present moment, let's begin with a backward glance at another pivotal moment in the convergent histories of US racial, constitutional, and presidential politics. Some months after the 1912 election that put Woodrow Wilson in the White House, Crisis Magazine published an open letter to the new president written by its editor, W.E.B. Du Bois, the distinguished historian, historian, social theorist, and cultural critic. Du Bois, who had supported the Democratic candidate, argued that Wilson's victory, secured in part by the black vote, presented an historic opportunity. As the first Southern occupant of the Oval Office since Andrew Johnson, argued Du Bois, Wilson was uniquely positioned to forge, I'm quoting him here, a just and righteous solution to the burning human wrong of the Negro problem, which Du Bois said was, quote, in many respects, the greatest problem facing the nation. Du Bois lamented Wilson's peculiar lack of personal acquaintance with individual black men, this again is Du Bois, but did not see this handicap, as he called it, as an insoluble problem. Du Bois contended that the Negro problem would remain insoluble only so long as, quote, men insist on settling it wrong, on set, settling it wrong by asking absolutely contradictory things. In the Souls of Black Folks, his magisterial 1903 collection of essays and sketches, Du Bois had famously argued that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Du Bois used the image of the color line to show how the political and legal geography of the Jim Crow regime segregated and divided Americans from one another. The concept also gave him the language to describe the interior line of division or dividuation that white racial rule carved within Americans of African descent. The Souls of Black Folks depicts this internally riven, split, individual American, African American self as the bearer of a double consciousness. An American, writes Du Bois, a Negro, two thoughts, two souls, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. The African American for Du Bois was a double self, a captive within the suffocating shades of a prison house, this is his image, whose relentlessly tall, narrow, and unscalable walls made it impossible to merge his sick double self into a better and truer self that could be both a Negro and an American. For Du Bois, the tensed two-ness of black identity and experience could not be understood without grasping the continuities and convergences that connect the public socio-political boundaries of the color line and the intra-individual psychosocial and cultural boundaries of the color bind. Du Bois subject in the souls of black folks is the peculiar sensation, as he wrote, of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others and measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. Du Bois construed white racial rule under Jim Crow as a regime of visibilization, thus the focus in the souls of black folks on how the Negro was seen. By contrast, his preoccupation in the letter to President Wilson was with the language of race, with how black Americans were talked and written about. This is Du Bois. The wide conspiracy 
to make Negroes known to their fellow Americans, not as flesh as blood, not as flesh and blood, but as beasts of fiction, rely on racial discourse as well as on racial terror and domination. Du Bois viewed white resistance to black demands for the rights of man in the American Republic as an ideological war of signification, waged through the strategic weaponization and the tactical deployment of coterminous but conflicting words. Du Bois wrote, you cannot make 10,000 people at one and the same time servile and dignified, docile and self-reliant, servants and independent leaders, segregated and yet part of the industrial organism, disfranchised and citizens of a democracy, ignorant and intelligent. This is impossible. And the impossibility is not factitious. It is in the very nature of things. A full century later, and almost near the end of the second term of the first black American president, we inhabit a radically different political world than the world in which Du Bois and Wilson lived. And yet, despite these continuities, the picture that Du Bois drew of a black American public trying to navigate an impossible minefield of absolutely contradictory things is remarkably relevant of our contemporary political landscape. When one sets the white racial imaginary of the servile, dignified, docile, self-reliant, ignorant, intelligent, leaders, servants, citizens, disenfranchised Negroes of the Jim Crow era, alongside the imaginary domain of today's patriotic traitor traitorous, clean, unkempt, mainstream, marginal, Democrat, socialist, liberal, communist, Christian, Muslim, native, alien, arrogant, obsequious, weak, dictatorial, conciliatory, divisive, angry, amiable, aloof, integrated, isolated, articulate, criminal, law-abiding African-American, the continuities are both uncanny and undeniable. In fine, Du Bois's depiction of the tangled web of opposite, opposed, and overlapping ideas, identities, ideologies, and images could just as well be used to describe the terms of the political discourse on race in our own time, a moment one might call, as some have, the age of Obama. Lest I be misunderstood, let me say straight away that although I characterize today's political conjuncture as the age of Obama, I am not referring to the individual person or personality of Barack Obama as such, although I will want to say something later about the brand of personality politics he has come to represent. Rather, my interest here is in Obamaism, a term I shall use just this once, as a project. In the first instance, the age of Obama is a convenient, if not entirely satisfactory, shorthand for the currents of political thought and practice that Mr. Obama not only represents, but has come in both a symbolic and substantive sense to embody. More broadly, the term is also meant to reference the disseminated and institutionalized impact of the Obama thought style as a cultural context and setting for understanding the ways in which Americans are starting to think and talk about race, racism, and racial justice today. In this latter sense, to call the present woman the age of Obama is to highlight an aspect of the shared objective situation which determines the substantive content and the structural limits of, Amer of the way Americans can think and talk about the question of race. Let me note, too, that in remarking the continuities in public racial discourse across the early 20th and 21st centuries, I am not unmindful of the differences between them. The most significant of these is, of course, the fact that we no longer live in the racial state whose political institutions codified and enforced white supremacy and white skin privilege as formal law and policy. A less obvious but no less significant difference between Jim Crow America and the post-civil rights era has to do with what I like to think of as the subjective side of social relations in America today. What I have in mind here, principally, is the psychic life of racial power that Du Bois sought to capture 
in his notion of black American double consciousness. In our postmodern political present, the split double self to which Du Bois adverts has given way to an even more fragmented, multifractal racial self. Contemporary racial subjectivities ramify across a number of different and divergent domains and directions. The postmodern multifractal racial subject is shaped by and interacts with multiple, multivalent, and often contradictory economic and social forces, ideologies, norms, and institutions, including those of law and politics. These racial formations inform, transform, and reform racial categories, racial language, and racial experience in a dance of dynamic and often unsettling disequilibrium. I underscore the discursive dimensions of race and a cognitive mapping of race as a dynamic field of contested and conflictual meanings for a number of reasons, principally because they seem to me to be essential ingredients in answering the questions I began with about the nature and meaning of racial politics in the age of Obama. In pressing this view of the constitutive connection between political language and the languages of race. I do not want to suggest that the Obama White House has ignored or had no impact at the less expressive, explicitly instrumental level of retail race and race-related policy. My claim, rather, is that the single most significant aspect of Mr. Obama's racial politics and the source of its most salient contradictions is the way the Obama administration has engaged exercised and exploited the communicative governance style that Jeffrey Toulis has denominated the rhetorical presidency. A second related contention is that President Obama's deployment of the rhetorical executive power, if you will, has as much to do with the identity of the occupant as it does with the incidents of the office. Like that of Woodrow Wilson, the white southerner whom Toulis credits with the institutionalization of the rhetorical presidency, Barack Obama's standing as a rhetor of race stems in no small part from the strange personal influence and power of identity and identification. When Mr. Obama has addressed himself to questions of race, what is said and who is saying it, speaker and speech, combine and converge in a tight intrication of man, message, and meaning that is notoriously difficult to disentangle. I propose to look at three distinct but related dimensions along which the rhetorical presidency of Barack Obama has changed the political terrain of US racial discourse. I call these first the ethnicization of race, second, the moralization of race, and third, the neoliberalization or the marketization, if you will, of race. Although these rhetorical reconstructions of race and racial meaning advance an imaginal politics of racial progress and democracy, they have in fact not only proven to be compatible with, but deeply complicit in the contemporary depoliticization of racial politics and the de-democratization or the undoing of the racial demos. Taken together, the discursive processes of ethnicizing, moralizing, and neoliberalizing race have renormed racial politics and normalized the post-civil rights era counter-revolution, at least with respect to the formal politics of the state. Right? We can talk about civil society politics uh, in the Q&A, but I'm talking about uh, the rhetorical presidency and the ways in which this rhetorical presidency is recreating the relationship between race and government or the state in new uh, and uh, important ways. I argue that President Obama's strategic re-symbolization of race not only represents a decisive moment in the history of the rhetorical presidential power, but a transformative historical moment in the constitutional culture of contemporary American politics. So, ethnic race, moral race, and market race, or neoliberal race. Ethnic race, moral race, and market race. 
In August 2008, the New York Times Sunday Magazine published a cover story whose headline took the form of a question to its readers. The urgency of the question was graphically underscored by the accompanying cover art, made up of huge white majuscule letters and set in the style of the conceptual artist Jenny Holzer against a stark black background. It read simply, is Obama the end of black politics? Question mark. Although journalist Matt Bai's article purported to be a report on black politics in the post-civil rights era, its real subject was the politics of what the Times website version of the piece called post-race. The central motif of the essay is the sad and stubborn resistance of the race-obsessed older black leaders who refuse to acknowledge the success of their struggle and embrace the idea, this is by, that black politics might now be disappearing into American politics in the same way that the Irish and Italian political machines long ago joined the political mainstream. In Bai's formulation, the disappearance of black politics into the more universal mainstream of American politics was not simply an idea, but an ideal. The end of political as opposed to cultural blackness and the dissolution of race as a meaningful category or mobilizing force in African-American political life. Bai painted a compelling portrait of Senate, then Senator Obama and his generational cohort as an emerging cadre of post-black power, that's his phrase, authentically post-racial politicians, a generation that, quote, saw the world through post-civil rights eyes, unquote. The problem was that by Bai's own account, the elision of black and race and the related notion that the rise of a post-black political class would herald the dawn of a post-racial politics had been severely tested if not flatly contradicted by the recurring role that race played during Democratic, the, pres the Democratic presidential primary campaign season. And since I'm in Philadelphia, I have to talk about the race speech, right? Um, however, it was not that Bai's picture of Senator Obama as an authentically post-racial politician was an image the candidate had done nothing at all to cultivate, or at the very least, used to his advantage. Indeed, one of the most impressive aspects of Mr. Obama's public pronouncements on race, both as candidate and later as president, is its consistent, disciplined ambiguity. One commentator has dubbed Mr. Obama's rhetorical style with respect to race as signifying without specifying. The terms of Mr. Obama's presidential engagement with the race problem were previewed in the March 2008 campaign speech at Philadelphia's convention center after he was forced to address the controversy surrounding his former pastor, the Reverend Jeremiah Wright. In a more perfect union, popularly known as the race speech, then Senator Obama connected the politics of race to a broader narrative of liberal multicultural nationalism. The strategy he used so effectively during his 2000 keynote, 2004 keynote address to the Democratic National Convention. The convention center speech was a masterful performance of politics that changed the dynamic of the presidential primary contest. It also allowed Senator Obama to reposition himself in a contentious debate that his campaign had so clearly hoped to avoid. Mr. Obama took care to frame his arguments about the complexity of race in this country, that's his phrase, in balanced and even-handed terms. Throughout the speech, the candidate held black anger and white resentment, resentment in a kind of rhetorical equipoise, parsing equal blame and displaying equal empathy on both sides of the racial divide. Mr. Obama decried the racial stalemate in which the country had been mired for years and lamented, quote, the chasm of misunderstanding between the races that has blocked America's progress on the path to a more perfect union. Mr. Obama emphatically rejected the idea that white racism is endemic to America. In contesting the notion that racial injustice and inequality are integral, permanent features of our national identity, Mr. Obama offered up his own life story as exhibit in chief. I am the son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas. He then fused the personal and the political in a startling turn of phrase. My story, said Mr. Obama, 
has seared into my genetic makeup the, the idea that this nation is more than the sum of its parts, that out of many we are truly one. Since his election to the presidency, Mr. Obama's remarks on the topic of race have typically hewn to the we have different stories but common hopes language of racial liberalism that has served him so well since he burst on the national scene in 2004. In this regard, President Obama has followed the rhetorical script of every Democrat who has occupied the White House in the post-civil rights era. But he's also done something more and different. What makes Obama's racial word politics so unique is his bold, confident use of his personal history and even the person of his own body to explain and defend his vision of America as a liberal, multicultural body, body politic. Interpreted rhetorically, the future president's body politics in the Philadelphia speech can be read as a postmodern, democratic reimagining of the legal fiction that Tudor lawyers famously fashioned from the medieval political theology of the king's two bodies. The doctrine of the then uh, future president's two bodies, or more precisely, of one body that bears the twin metaphorical marks of blackness and whiteness of Kenya and Kansas, points in two different but related directions. On the first most visceral level, the shock induced by this image of Senator Obama's body creates a moment, however fleeting, in which the listener is invited to envision his or her own embodied person as a reflection and as a living repository of America's corporate political identity and existence. To belong to America is not merely to be a member of the American body politic, but a mirror uh, a mimetic mirror of the imagined community that is the nation. On a second more abstract level, the symbolically branded body, seared into my DNA, of Barack Obama offers an inchoate codification of the post-racial society that he has consistently, although sometimes coyly, insisted America has not yet become. Let me explain what I mean. One of the most puzzling aspects of our national word politics is the stubborn persistence of a kind of black racial exceptionalism in the stories we have made up and passed on throughout our history about the nature and meaning of American citizenship. The peculiar place of black political experience and black political identity in the civic tales and sermons we tell ourselves about belonging to America in Kenneth Carr's memorable image, is perhaps most clearly revealed in the different ways we think and talk about race and ethnicity. The official story, to quote the late Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell in the famous Bakke case, is that the United States is a nation of minorities, this is Powell, each of whom has had to struggle or overcome the prejudices of a majority that was itself composed of various minorities. The actual record, however, suggests that the story of American political community is considerably more complicated. Even when we've not acknowledged it, Americans have always understood, through a kind of political common sense, that the history and language of race and the history and language of chattel slavery, uh, I'm sorry, that the history and language of race are the history and language of chattel slavery, forced convict labor, lynching, and Jim Crow segregation. As we most often tell it, the history and language of ethnicity in this country are, by contrast, the history and language of immigration and the myths of Ellis Island, the Statue of Liberty, and the American melting pot. We conveniently forget that for most of US history, this nation's immigration law regime expressly denied the right of citizenship to immigrants from Asia, Africa, and the Middle East until the passage of the landmark Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, whose 50th anniversary we celebrate this year, the story of American ethnicity was a story about coming and belonging to a white America. U.S. immigration law and policy has served as a crucial political tool for fixing and enforcing the border between race and ethnicity. In short, the ethnic state has always also operated as a racial state. This story of the different and divergent meanings of race on the one hand and ethnicity, on the other, is a story of a fundamental and enduring political contradiction in the United States. 
even when black people have been formally acknowledged as citizens of the USA, as members of the nation state, they have never been fully or unequivocally accepted as Americans, as members of the country. Barack Obama's success as a professional politician, as a member of the professional political class, has turned in no small part on his keen sense of the symbolic dimensions of politics, the politics of de depiction, portrayal, image, and representation. This is not who we are. Hmm? Uh, in the way in which his interest or his skill uh, at forging different conceptions of the way that people can imagine themselves, right? Um, his talent and temperament and the times have uniquely positioned Mr. Obama to see and tap into a broad yearning in this country for fresh civic myths and new national narratives about what belonging to America means at the beginning of the 21st century. Marshalling and mixing personal autobiography, family chronicles and tales of political kinship, not just in his writings but in his speeches, this son of a black man from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas has written, or better, embodied and performed a story that centers and celebrates a liberal multicultural vision of American political identity in the post-civil rights era. Through a st strategic categorical miscegenation, to use Ray Charles' phrase, the politician who has famously called himself a mutt found a way to weave the stories, images, and legends of ethnicity and race into a new American dream narrative. This utopian narrative of American national identity ethnicizes race and racializes ethnicity, performing an act of what the late Daniel Patrick Moynihan once described as semantic infiltration. Mr. Obama has rhetorically fused race and ethnicity. The Philadelphia speech is a, a prime example of this in a way that sutures, if you will, race and ethnicity into a new concept image that I like to call ethnic race. The principal beneficiary of the new word politics of ethnic race has, of course, been Mr. Obama himself. Uh, as a presidential candidate, he fashioned ethnic race into a tactical word weapon to shut down, quote, commentators who have deemed me either too black or not black enough. In a brilliant tactical maneuver, Mr. Obama turned a potential political weakness to his advantage by using the language of ethnic race to change the terms of the public conversation about who and what he was. After Mr. Obama, there now exists um, a new, if still contested, common sense in this country that black American identities, like white or brown or yellow American identities, are or at least are capable of being as much about ethnicity culture and experience as about race, skin, and blood. Put another way, the post-Obama ethno-nationalization of race has created a cultural space in which a large segment of the American public has begun to experiment with and invent new ways of thinking and talking about race and racial politics. These still developing modes of political thought and language have engendered styles of politics most notably with respect to policing and mass incarceration that place race at their center, but do so in ways that push past the old ossified categories of racial identity and racial identification. In the White House years, the liberal multicultural ethnic race narrative has shaped President Obama's ongoing campaign to persuade black Americans that they can only hope to heal, I'm quoting him here, old racial wounds by binding our political grievances to the larger aspirations of all Americans, the white woman struggling to break the glass ceiling, the white man who has been laid off, the immigrant trying to feed his family. The symbolic integration of black citizens into the liberal multicultural idea of America compensates ideologically for the demonstrated failures of integration in the real world of racial democracy. Ethnic race, and its narrative of enlightened multicultural nationalism formed the basis then for a rhetorical governance strategy in the Obama presidency. The political image and ideology of ethnic race structures the discursive field in which Mr. Obama has used the powers of the rhetorical presidency to manage the contradiction of life in a black America that in many ways is worse off today 
across an astonishing number of indicators than it was before President Obama took office. The Obama administration's deft deployment of the, rape, the ethnic race idea thus offers an example of what Jelani Kalk has called the paradox of progress. Ethnic race has simultaneously served as a rhetorical vehicle for an imaginal, pol imaginal politics of black belonging and an ideological alibi for the many substantive harms that black civic publics have sustained in the age of Obama. The political dream work, if you will, of ethnic race and its concomitant structure of feeling are captured perfectly in the words of Mr. Obama's chief advisor, Valerie Jarrett. As a black person, you should feel confident, she says, she once said, that he will focus on your injustices and know that all the other injustices in other communities will affect you too. There have been wounds in all the communities not just in the black community. There are plenty of wounds to go around. How are we doing on time? I'm okay. Let us move then to racial moralism. In the larger uh, project from which today's talk is taken, I consider uh, two of Mr. Obama's speeches delivered before predominantly black audiences, the 2008 Father's Day speech at the conservative Evangelical Apostolic Church of God in Chicago, and the July 2009 President's remarks to the NAACP Centennial Convention in New York City. My goal um, is to describe the political work that these speeches do in, con in connection with the second aspect of the Obama rhetorical presidency, the ideological discourse that I've elsewhere called racial moralism. In moralizing race, black America's scolder in chief, uh, as my former colleague uh, Ted Shaw once described the president, has presided over the reconstruction and revival of the moral politics. Uh, this term, of course, is George Lakoff's, that scholars have variously called the politics of respectability. Uh, Evelyn Higginbotham and Frederick Douglass writing critically of this idea, or the politics of racial reputation, um, to use a phrase that uh, Randall Kennedy of Harvard has used, who's described uh, the core, in, who's defended the core intuitions of more respectability politics as sound. Now, among the things to note about the, the politics of moral racialism in the age of Obama are first, uh, that it is a kind of conditional racial contract uh, inasmuch as the political recognition of black interests turns on a prior demonstration of a kind of collective black moral probity. Um, and two, that it confuses moral regulation with democratic political mobilization, morality with politics. And three, that it ought accordingly to be understood as a displacement of politics. In Randall Kennedy's formulation, the politics of respectability consists of two tenets. The first is a factual premise that freed of crippling invidious racial discrimination, this is Kennedy, blacks are capable of meeting the established moral standards of white middle class Americans. The second plank in moral racialism's political platform is a normative claim that blacks need to be attuned to the ways that they are perceived by others. Although he's not explicit on this score, the others to whom Kennedy makes reference here uh, in his writings are white middle class Americans, or at least other non-white but non-black Americans who embrace, quote, the established standards of white middle class America. One might understand racial moralism as the externalized internal dimension of the black exceptionalism that I discussed in my account of, ethni of ethnic race. In the larger work from which uh, I'm presenting today, I hope to show how Mr. Obama's moralizing style has had deeply anti-political and anti-democratic effects. Drawing on the writings of a number of scholars, I want to argue that this aspect of Mr. Obama's rhetorical presidency forecloses an understanding of the vulnerability of black publics as a question of democratic justice. The debilitating effects of racial moralism operate across at least two different axes. First, 
moral racism injunction, uh, moral racism's injunction, to quote from the um, speech to the NAACP, that your destiny is in your hands, privilege is an ideology of individual responsibility that deprives black political analysis of and access to the language of rights. It is a mode of ideological interpolation, to use a phrase of the French philosopher Louis Althusser. It's a mode of ideological address that blocks access to the distinctive self-understandings that have historically created the conditions for black social justice movements, namely that African-American resistance to racial justice is rooted in a recognition of what one political uh, theorist has called our linked fate. Second, racial moralism unquestionably per perpetuates the myth of the uniquely black cultural pathology. This internal cultural explanation for racialized violence and domination thus forecloses structural understandings of threats to black communal stability and the impact on vulnerable black, on vulnerable black communities of economic underdevelop, underdevelopment, social deprivation, and political disempowerment. I think here of um, a piece by my colleague John McWhorter, uh, which focuses on uh, celebrating the prominence of the Obama family. Um, and the image of prominence that McWhorter most points to is uh, the embodiment of the Obama family as moral exemplars to the black nation as a whole. Right? And so this moral discourse is doing political work, even though, in fact, it has nothing to do with the sorts of structural considerations uh, that are at least as responsible uh, for the condition of black Americans today as these issues of culture and racial reputation. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to move on um, to the third feature of the rhetorical presidency of President Obama. In the previous section, I focused on the ways in which the Obama rhetorical presidency has advanced um, a kind of existential politics of ethnic race and a moral politics of race. I want now to turn to a consideration of the uses to which the president has put the rhetorical executive power to advance a post-civil rights agenda with respect to race and political economy. Much has been written about the consumer marketing strategy the Obama team devised during the 2008 campaign for the presidency. Building out the candidate's already outsized personality politics, Mr. Obama's ideas, identity, and image were packaged and pushed as a kind of high-end corporate brand. One consistent and striking feature of the Obama operation is the energy and ambition with which it is not merely made, but marketed the civic symbols and stories that define the ideolo ideological horizons of race and racial politics in the age of Obama. No modern occupant of the White House has shown as deep a financial investment in what might be called American dream politics as a consumer good. The Obama organization spent $650 million in 2008 and uh, over $1 billion in 2012. Mr. Obama and his team followed a focused and comprehensive strategy of political marketing. The campaign adopted a corporate business model that viewed each American voter as a product consumer, exploiting every existing resource of American symbolic politics and inventing new ones. Mr. Obama's ideas, his identity, and his image were packaged, projected, and promoted across every available platform. The campaign integrated internet technology to spread its message through texts and email, via cell phone and new media social networks. The Obama team commissioned slogans, Change You Can Believe In, a dedicated font, the iconic O logo, and the Hulk poster, purchased massive TV advertising, and created Fight the Smears, uh, a Fight the Smears website to counter claims that Mr. Obama was Muslim, communist, or Kenyan. A huge travel budget flew the Obama team during 2008 to Kuwait, Afghanistan, Iraq, Jordan, the West Bank, Israel, Germany, France, and the UK. Photo ops were staged with Warren Buffett, Paul Volcker, and Oprah Winfrey, amplifying the candidates' already outsized personality politics in every medium and in multiple media markets, Mr. Obama became a product that the campaign packaged and pushed 
as a high-end corporate brand. As a well-known advertising mogul succinctly put it, Barack Obama is three things you want in a brand, new, different, and attractive. Joe Biden, the man who would join Mr. Obama on the Democratic ticket, was a bit more expansive, if less adept. He's the first mainstream African-American, articulate, bright, clean, and a nice-looking guy. That all changed once Mr. Obama assumed the presidency. Desiree Rogers, the Harvard MBA who served the Obama administration as its first social secretary, was reprimanded for telling the Wall Street Journal that she wanted to Obamatize the White House experience. We have the best brand in the world, she was quoted as saying, the Obama brand. The president's special advisor, Dave Laxerod, reportedly reminded Rogers that Mr. Obama was a person, not a product. We shouldn't be referring to him as a brand. Despite the administration's public disavowals, the, person, the president is a person, not a product. The political marketing that defined Mr. Obama's bid for the White House, often framed in the language of communication, has also been a hallmark of his governance style. Indeed, Mr. Obama's presidential branding campaign actually began before the election. In an early 2008 interview, Mr. Obama declared his admiration for the transformational presidency of Ronald Reagan, praising the sense of dynamism and entrepreneurship that Mr. Reagan brought to the job. The professed bromance with the godfather of political neoliberalism sent a clear signal. An Obama White House would do nothing to challenge the dominance of the neoliberal market state model of presidential power established by Mr. Reagan and continued by his successors. Indeed, even though he assumed office at the height of a global financial crisis, Mr. Obama and the economic elite who advised him have not strayed too far from the neoliberal playbook that guided the political makeover of the post-war welfare capitalist state into the corporate post-industrial financial complex of today's market state. In one passage of the Philadelphia race speech, Mr. Obama railed against the special interests in Washington, the shuttered mills, the glut of foreclosed homes for sale, and the corporations that have shipped American jobs for nothing more than a profit. Since his tenure in the Oval Office, however, Mr. Obama has yet to reckon in any serious or sustained way with the contradiction and inconsistency between his pre-presidential attacks on corporate power and the corporate brand management style that has characterized his tenure as Chief Executive Officer of Democracy, Inc. in Sheldon Wolin's image, the managed democracy of neoliberal capitalism. Like his predecessors, President Obama has used the powers of the presidency to support and defend the continued political dominance of the neoliberal economic order. But he has gone one step further investing considerable energy and effort to extend the reach and power of what might be called cultural neoliberalism. If neoliberal governance politics seeks to maintain the powers and prerogatives of the market-regulated state, neoliberal cultural politics aims to remake the whole of society in the image of the market. Its agenda, to quote John Berger, is to cultivate popular consent to and build a cultural consensus around a view of the world in which everything and everybody can be reduced to a calculation of profit that can be packaged, promoted, and sold, purchased, and consumed. Retooling the consumer marketing model that put it in the White House and placing the person, or more precisely, the personality politics of the president himself at its center, the Obama Organization has branded race or more precisely, racial neoliberalism. If Ronald Reagan was our first neoliberal president, Barack Obama, a University of Chicago Democrat, as he's been called, is our first black neoliberal president. Look, he's once said, I'm a pro-growth, pre-market guy. I love the market. Indeed, Mr. Obama's rhetorical presidency confirms the contention of Michael Dawson that no deep understanding of neoliberalism is possible without a grasp of its significance and character as an ideological formation. Barack Obama is the first US president in the neoliberal era whose background, politics, professed values and ideas, and personal skills have uniquely positioned him to sell 
neoliberal programs and policies, deregulation, privatization, austerity, um, corporate bailouts, and the like, to a group of Americans whose lives, families, and communities have been disproportionately ravaged and deracinated by the social decimation, cultural deprivation, and economic devastation that has accompanied the rise of the neoliberal state. Bernard Harcourt, my colleague at Columbia, has argued that the heart of neoliberalism is its attempt to displace political conflict, contestation, and struggle by extending an idea of order orderliness from the economic realm to other spheres of human existence and practice. This seems to me to offer a perfect summary description of the animating idea behind contemporary post-black power racial politics generally and Barack Obama's uh, rhetorical presidency in particular. Consider in this connection the rhetorical politics of the president's 2009 address in New York to the Centennial Convention of the National Advancement Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the largest and most important black civil society organization in the world. The president began his remarks with a litany of the challenges faced by the communities from which many of his listeners had come. This is the president. We know that even as our economic crisis batters Americans of all races, African Americans are out of work more than just about anybody else. We know that even as spiraling health care costs crush families of all races, African Americans are more likely to suffer from a host of diseases, but less likely to own health insurance than just about anybody else. We know that even as we imprison more people of all races than any nation of, in, in the world, an African American child is roughly five times as likely as a white child to see the inside of a prison. We know that even as the scourge of HIV AIDS devastates nations abroad, particularly in Africa, it is devastating the African American community here at home with disproportionate force. We know these things. Mr. Obama acknowledged the pain of discrimination that is still felt in America and then asked his audience to indulge him while he offered a few more detailed observations on the state of our schools, where the story of the civil rights movement was written, as he put it, noting that half a century after Brown v. Board, the dream of a world-class education is still being deferred all across the country, the president pointed up the higher dropout rates and lower grades and test scores in math and reading among African-American children. He called attention to the overcrowded classrooms and crumbling schools to which the children of poor Americans were consigned. Nonetheless, speaking to a black audience in a city whose public schools are the most racially segregated in the United States, Mr. Obama insisted that the state of American schools was not an African American problem, it is an American problem. Why not the poor state of the schools to which disproportionate numbers of black and brown Americans be, be go be viewed as a problem that concerns all Americans? One might have expected a president of the United States, who is a former teacher of constitutional law, to draw on the brown idea that educational inequity denies poor children of color access to the cultural values and literacy which are a prerequisite for effective participation in civil society or impedes their ability to claim the rights and discharge the duties of democratic citizenship. But rather than framing issues of educational inequity as an issue of democratic justice, Mr. Obama offered a textbook neoliberal explanation of what makes unequal schooling in America an America pro American problem. He said this, if black, brown and black children cannot compete, then America cannot compete. Doubling down on this theme, President Obama insisted that government programs alone won't get our children to the promised land. In, instead, he argued, we need a new mindset, a new set of attitudes, and an end to the internalized sense of limitation that has led so many in our community to expect so little from the world and from themselves. How are black Americans to forge the new racial consciousness that would empower their children to overcome the small sense of themselves that was one of the most durable and destructive legacies of di discrimination? The solution Mr. Obama offered up to his audience was a neoliberalized version of racial uplift. The ideological core of this neoliberal respectability politics, in which democracy emerges as a synonym for capitalism, is a belief that, in the president's words, there is a connection 
between the freedom of the marketplace and freedom more generally. In this vision of politics, civic freedom is economized, as it were, reduced to nothing more than the market freedom to compete. We've got to say to our children, yes, if you're African American, the odds of growing up amid crime and gangs are high. Yes, if you live in a poor neighborhood, you will face challenges that somebody in a wealthy suburb does not have to face. But that's not a reason to get bad grades. That's not a reason to cut class. That's not a reason to give up on your education and drop out of school. No one has written your destiny for you. Your destiny is in your hands. You cannot forget that. That's what we have to teach all of our children. No excuses, no excuses. Stuart Hall once observed that one hallmark of the neoliberal political economies that Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan imposed in the UK and the US was a high threshold of tolerance for inconsistency and incoherence. Reagan and Thatcher both appreciated and mastered the purely rhetorical and symbolic work of politics, spinning webs of words to paper over the deep contradiction between the theory and practices of neoliberalism, reframing and reworking them rhetorically. Much may be said about the discursive strategies that characterize the rhetorical presidency of Barack Obama. The most stunning feature of the president's address is the way it manages simultaneously to bring and hold different and divergent ideas and images. Thus, on the one hand, the president acknowledges the force of structural inequalities that still plague too many communities and are the object of national neglect. On the other, he insists that the children of the black and brown poor who are trapped in the corridors of shame we call public school schools have no excuses if they end up in the ranks of young men on the corners of Harlem or the south side of Chicago. Following Bernard Harcourt, we might say that the market competitivization of black freedom, President Obama urges his NAACP listeners to embrace, promotes a post-conflictual politics of acquiescence, which is in fact deeply anti-political. Like the larger neoliberal project it legitimates, the racial neoliberal order over which President Obama has presided continues and consolidates the economization of American politics, but in a different color. Race has always been a foundational feature of capitalism, but racial neoliberalism marks a new stage in the history of racial capitalism. The neoliberal brand management of race financializes and profitizes black civic publics and black political culture. Indeed, and even more decadently, racial neoliberalism marks and markets blackness itself as a political consumption good. And here, the symbolic connection to the brutal marking of black bodies under slavery is both ironic and uncanny. Racial neoliberalism exploits and increases the economic and political market value of race in today's ethno-racial moment. Consider the seamless corporate branding of diversity that the application of consumer marketing strategy has made possible. At the same time, it consolidates and extends the political predominance of the market state. Racial neoliberalism provides an ideological alibi, which simultaneously hides and strengthens the economic order that maintains the structures of racialized social, economic, and political inequality. Viewed from its underbelly, racial neoliberalism is perhaps most productively understood as the new neoliberal racism. Some have said that Barack Obama has painted the White House black. My aim this afternoon has been to suggest why and how the Obama administration's symbolic transformation of racial meanings cannot be separated from the broader turn to racial neoliberalism. The programs and policies of the neoliberal market state have proven to be a nightmare for black and brown Americans, and indeed for poor and working class Americans of every race. The paradox and the secret scandal of the Obama presidency is that the neoliberal racial citizenship it offers is a promissory note that can't be cashed. The friction between capitalism and democracy, which is endemic to democratic capitalism, has with the triumph of political neoliberalism, sundered democracy from capitalism. The capture of American politics by market rationalities and the rise of the neoliberal corporate state have consigned the social justice vision that produced the civil rights revolution and that in an important sense produced Mr. Obama. 
and its, and its insistence on the primacy of the social over the economic to the margins of political discourse. For the disproportionately black and brown precariat, this means, in effect, that the political condition of racial neoliberalism is a state of affairs in which the American dream has become an impossible dream. The question, to paraphrase Du Bois, is whether the impossibility that haunts Mr. Obama, Mr. Obama's dream politics is merely factitious or in the very nature of things. Thank you for your patience and attention. Well, I think um, there's a cynical explanation that I could offer um, and a non-cynical explanation that I can offer. Uh, I do believe that the Trayvon moment was a heartfelt moment. I think it was a, it was a, um, it was a moment which rocked the nation and, of course, could not um, have helped but affected the president as a human being and as a citizen of these United States. Um, he began by saying um, there were two speeches, as you recall, or at least two press conferences or interventions. One was um, Trayvon Martin could have been his son, right? and the second was that um, that could have been him 30 years ago. Right? Uh, but I think that story is perfectly consistent with a predominantly moral understanding of the political terror of anti-black violence. Right? Um, it's a moral problem and a consequence of our fundamental failure to look past skin color to see the moral personhood of those Americans who are part of this imagined community of the nation to which we all belong. There are also these more recent and quite high visibility moments which have to do uh, with such things as a visit to the prison. Uh, but it is, in fact, the case that, um, talking about prisons, um, Mr. Obama, at least not to my knowledge, has said nothing about the neoliberalization of the prison, right? The, the occupation of prisons, uh, the running of prisons by private companies whose uh, raison d'etre is profit, right? Um, nor has he yet said anything uh, about the fact, and this is a fact, uh, that by the end of his uh, two terms, Mr. Obama will have incarcerated more undocumented immigrants in immigration detention facilities than the previous president did in both his terms. And he'd already done that before the end of, of, of his second term. And many of these prisons are run by corporations on a strict neoliberal model. There are a certain number, so many thousands of beds, that have to be filled every night, which has given rise to all sorts of um, unseemly public-private partnerships to keep this machinery, this neoliberal machinery, which is privatized what used to be public functions, uh, running. So the cynical explanation would be that he's branding his post-presidency. right? Um, and it may be that we will look back on the large political career of Mr. Obama as one in which uh, and I hope this, this will be the case. Um, he uh, did, after he was president, uh, more uh, to highlight and address the problems of racial justice broadly understood than he did during his presidency. Uh, I'm hopeful in that regard, which is why um, I choose not to view um, the way in which the president has been repositioning himself around a whole range of issues, most notably incarceration and immigration. Um, in a cynical light. Yes, in the back. And so uh, I try to make sure I, I can say this in the most professional way possible. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like with Obama, there were some things that you know the people who I can say I supported him, you know, both terms, all that good 
Mm-hmm. But I felt like there came a moment, right, where um, I remember meeting him at a fundraiser, and you know he jacked me up, and we we all understand, you know, as, as black folks, what that means, right? When somebody meets you and you know how to take them in some way, simply by a handshake, mm-hmm. you know. And I found it very interesting because we were hopeful in that first pregnancy, which kind of understood, like, hey, he can't say everything. Say, mm-hmm. but when that second pregnancy or second term comes, I know he's going to say it now. Mm-hmm. And we have been waiting. Mm-hmm. And then the Baltimore situation happened. Mm-hmm. And I think that was the moment where I think I left, I was watching that television and hearing him call young kids thugs. Mm-hmm. And it just ripped me to my core to think about the fact that you are now, anytime Fox News can play a clip of him. And celebrate the president, saying, "See, he even called us." Mm-hmm. I mean, it it just makes you wonder what. Why is he still walking this line? You know, when, when we expected him through his speech and through his stance and posture in his second term to dap us up, mm-hmm. and he's still shaking our hand. Mm-hmm. When he has that moment to say something, he's still shaking our hand. You know, so I'm just wondering, you know, what do you think about it? Like, I feel like he just doesn't. Signifying without specifying. He's been signaling a lot. But, you know, I, I don't even know if his, his specificity <coughs> can help with some cases that he's just gone totally to the right. Well, I'm, I'm going to um, respond to what you just said, uh, mindful of the fact that you made a comment um, and offered an insight uh, that I think speaks for itself. Right? Um, I think of President Sarkozy in France, who, used, uh, who described the young black and brown kids who rioted in the, um, the banlieue as racaille, scum. Right? Um, and it's very hard to imagine scum as citizens. Right? Uh, very hard to imagine scums as your children. Right? Uh, very hard to imagine scum uh, as who you might have been 30 years ago. And that disidentification is perfectly consistent um, with the kind of respectability, black respectability politics elevated to the level of official state discourse that is uh, what I've been trying to describe as the rhetorical presidency of uh, Mr. Obama. Um, I, I must confess, I, I, I've, been, I've, I've had some trepidation about presenting this work um, because I, I don't want anything I've said to be understood as an ad hominem attack. Um, one of the things about the, the, the piece uh, that I mentioned that was a cover story for the New York Times Sunny Magazine, which asked, is Obama the end of black politics? Um, was I thought, okay, maybe the Obama presidency will be the beginning of black politics. Maybe we can break um, the straitjacket of a kind of uh, contract uh, that has limited uh, the kinds of robust ideological discussions that African Americans have been able to have with one another about these issues of race, um, and just get it all out in the open. Right? Uh, I think in, in some respects, some of that is happening. I think the pushback, for example, um, of the Black Lives Matter movement that emerged in Ferguson, uh, and their resolute suspicion um, on the one side of the old political class that was uh, led by uh, black clergy and um, their uh, suspicion on the other of Mr. Holder um, when he visited uh, the St. Louis era, area um, signified the emergence of um, 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 a conflictual politics, um, an agonistic politics in the black community, which I think on the whole may be very healthy. Um, and may signal the beginnings of a black politics which has some antecedents, but which we've never really been able um, to fully uh, develop right? uh, without um, uh, the, the unsalutary effects of, of the politics of identity right? uh, as, a, as a kind of trump card to shut down conversation about open conversation about ideological differences and different and contested visions um, of what a progressive black politics 
should look like. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, affect our perception and our interpretation of what is uh, what uh, President Obama has accomplished or not accomplished. Because being the first one, you give him a heavier scrutiny, mm-hmm. uh, a heavier weight, mm-hmm. and an expectation is mm-hmm. placed on, on him. So are we being over-realistic as to what he should or should not have done in his presidency? Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's a great question, and it's a question uh, that has been at the center of a lot of conversations um, between and among people who uh, have defended President Obama um, without qualification and those uh, who have been uh, more critical. Um, is it um, Steve Harvey on his radio show? I remember there's a clip on YouTube where someone calls in. Well, he's talking, in fact, um, about um, Tavis Smiley and Cornel West. And um, the, I wish I had the transcript here. He really is angry at, 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 at them. Um, and the heart of his disagreement, um, over and above some um, unfortunate ad hominem attacks is the fact that Harvey put it, they don't recognize that he's not the president of black America, he's president of all America, right? And so this line that um, as the first black American president, he's the president of all America and cannot be seen uh, to be treating a particular constituency as favored or seeking special rights for them um, is, a, is a plausible one, right? But um, that doesn't mean uh, that um, that constituency had to be ignored altogether. I think, um, and I'm going to close here, I think of a passage from uh, the epilogue uh, of Judge Higginbotham's book, In the Matter of Color, in which he, you know, the book is about the colonial period, race and the legal process, and more broadly, racial politics during the colonial period. And uh, Judge Higginbotham writes, in every major respect, colorblind, uh, a colonial law uh, in what would become the US was an instrument of injustice. Even on the birth of the new nation, the founding fathers still subjected blacks to a persistent cruelty that was far more oppressive than the deprivations over which white Americans waged the revolution. But it need not have been that way. The branding of any group as inferior or less than human on the basis of color was not inevitable. And so the point I've been trying to make is that this rush, this race um, to wrap, to to, to enjoin, to invite, to incite African Americans to wrap themselves in the mantle of what I've been calling racial neoliberalism um, was not inevitable. And it was not the, the blood price, as it were, that we had to pay for uh, this very important um, and I think transformative political development in our democracy, the election of the first African-American president. I don't want to demean or diminish in any way the significance of that. Now I have nieces and nephews who when they think of the president will see in their imaginary, uh, in their imaginations, someone who looks like them. I think that is crucially important, but the question was, did that achievement have to come at the cost of a situation in which when the president gave um, his speech on the mall uh, at the 50th anniversary of the I Have a Dream uh, speech, another neoliberal spectacle, um, African Americans were worse off, right? Black unemployment in 2013 when the president gave that speech was 13%. When uh, Dr. Martin Luther King gave the I Have a Dream speech, black employment was 10%, right? So the, the wages of this inclusion, this suturing into, this weaving of black Americans into the American dream, into ethnic race, this symbolically important and I think transformative development has had a material cost uh, that I think we have to insist 
on offering an accounting of as we move forward, particularly as we move forward into the years of the post-Obama presidency.